Question 41. Dynasty Corporation in 2016 reported current liabilities of $312 million and an ending balance of $35 million in cash, accounts receivable of $12 million, and marketable securities of $1.3 million. Dynasty Corporation's cash ratio is closest to. So our cash ratio is going to be um, pretty simple. It's going to be our cash plus cash equivalents over our current liabilities. Um, so basically we're going to take this 35 million, add uh, 1.3 million of marketable securities, um, and then divide that by that 312 million. And those marketable, marketable securities are just going to be probably treasury bonds or something like that, something very liquid that's cash-like. Um, so when we do that, we get 0.1163, round that up to uh, 0.12. Um, if you use the quick ratio, um, which would have included accounts receivable, you would have gotten uh, answer C, just as an FYI. Um, so that's why it's important to make sure we know that formula, because if we plug in the wrong numbers, we might still get an answer that's on here. Question 42. Which of the following cases is the capitalization of development costs most likely prohibited? In the case of A, an IFRS compliant company, B, software development by a company following US GAAP, or C, the development of a life-saving drug by a company following US GAAP. So we can go ahead and rule out A right away since um, IFRS um, is never going to, or is always going to allow capitalization of development costs. Um, so we can rule that out since it won't be prohibited under IFRS. And then under U.S. GAAP, um, U.S. GAAP generally is going to require research and development costs to be expensed as incurred. Um, but there is exceptions for in the case of software development. Um, so software development is going to be our key here for this answer. So we can, uh, we'll end up crossing off C and we'll go with B um, since these are both under GAAP. But this one includes the uh, exceptions for software development. Question 43. A firm purchased a three-year callable bond for $950 with the intent of making a profit in the short term. After the first year of holding the security, the value of the bond has decreased to $890. If the firm reports under U.S. GAAP, determine the appropriate treatment of the amount of the loss on the bond. So we've got no loss will be recognized or a loss of 60 will be recognized on the income statement or a loss of 60 will be recognized in changers in stockholders equity. So we need, first need to determine whether there's going to be a loss that we're recognizing um, or not. And then if we are recognizing a loss, where that's going to go show up in the financial statements. Um, so the key here when we're looking at this is this statement right here, intent of making a profit in the short term. Um, so since we're going to be making a profit in the short term, we know that we're going to be categorizing this security as held for trading. Um, so that being said, when we're categorizing a, a security as held for trading, um, our, our losses and gains are going to be, um, are going to show up on the income statement because of our intent. Um, so we're going to end up going with B, loss of $60 will show up on the income statement. And it's really due to that intent of making a profit in the short term. We are buying the security with hopes that we'll able to sell it at a profit. So it's deemed as kind of part of our operations of the business. And so it shows up on the income statement. Um, it's not going to show up on the uh, stockholders equity statement. And then for A, um, we would recognize no loss if we were planning on holding the security to maturity. And then in that case, we'd classify it as held to maturity um, and we wouldn't be recognizing the uh, mark to market value on the income statement. So we'll go with B. Question 44. Compared to the same period last year, wind corporation tax rate has increased from 22% to 25%. Therefore, wind corporations, A, tax deferred asset has increased, B, tax deferred liability has increased, or C, tax deferred assets and liability have both increased. So 
um, just to level set here, deferred tax asset is it's an asset because it has the potential to reduce our future income or tax liability um, due to likely some uh, higher tax paid in the current period or past period. Um, and then deferred tax liability is basically taxes that we think we're going to owe in the future. So we're creating those as a liability of something we'll owe. So if our tax um, rate increases, this means that our deferred tax asset will be worth more in the future because it's going to be um, offsetting a higher, basically a higher tax rate of income. So if taxes are going to be higher in the future, our deferred tax asset will be able to offset a, uh, a higher tax um, income. And then for deferred tax liability, this will also, the deferred tax liability will also increase because if our tax rate is higher, um, the uh, amount that we're going to owe on that liability is going to go up. Um, so since we've got increase in A, increase in B, and then C is both increase, we will go with C. Both the asset and the liability have increased. Question 45. Die Corp reported in 2014 a net income of $1.2 million, total assets and total debt of $8.5 million and $1.5 million respectively. So we've got total assets of $8.5 million and debt of $1.5 million. Assuming that total debt equals total liabilities, Die Corp's debt to capital ratio is closest to. So our debt to capital um, is going to be debt over debt plus equity or um, debt over assets. So we're going to have um, debt, which is going to be that 1.5 million that we're given here um, over the assets, which is uh, 8.5 million. And this is just converting um, debt plus equity equals assets based on the balance sheet. And so since we're giving assets in the question, um, that's why we want to understand that so we can convert that over. Um, if we were given equity in the uh, question, then we would need to add the 1.5 million to whatever the equity was for our denominator. Um, but anyway, so we... Uh, Throw those two values together, we get 1.5 over 8.5 gives us 0.1765. Round that up and go with B. Okay. Question 46. Consider the following information about Zenga Company. We've got the year as 2014, uh, profit of 145,000, asset turnover, return on assets, return on equity. In 2014, the net profit margin, margin for Zenga Company is closest to. So uh, for this problem, we're going to be taking this ROE formula and then rearranging it to solve for net profit margin. So our ROE is going to equal net profit margin times asset turnover times financial leverage, um, which we do the algebra, and this is what we get. Um, so we're given a return on equity and asset turnover. Um, within this formula, but we are not given the financial leverage. So what we need to do from here is figure out the financial leverage number that we'll need to plug into here. Uh, and so if you recall, our uh, financial leverage ratio or our financial leverage number that we can derive from these numbers given is going to be ROE over ROA. So we do that 0 0.06 over 0 0.09 gives us uh, 0.667. Um, so now we can go ahead and plug that number in for our uh, leverage. I just round up to 0.67. Um, but those numbers correspond to what we're given. So we've got 0.06 for the ROE, 0.4 for our asset turnover, and then that 0.67 number plugged in there. Uh, we get 0.2239, uh, which rounds to 22%. Question 47. A company uses the U.S. GAAP... Uh, to prepare its financial statements, which of the, the items listed below is least likely going to be reported as an operating activity? So we've got interest paid, dividends paid, and interest received. Um, I'm going to pull in this table here from the answer um, on the website. Um, so 
So looking through here, we've got our interest received. We can see under gap, that's going to be an operating activity. Um, so that won't be our answer. And we've got interest paid also as an operating activity. So that also won't be our answer. Come down here to dividends paid and we'll see this is going to be a financing activity, um, which is what we're looking for since we had least likely to be an operating activity. So we're going to go with B, dividends paid. And the reason for this is just that dividends paid out are seen as a purely um, financial activity. You're just giving money back to the shareholders. It doesn't really have anything to do with the operations of the business. Um, whereas interest paid, uh, likely if we're paying interest, that debt is going to be used to finance day-to-day -day activities of the business. Um, so that can go, that'll go under uh, operating activity. And then uh, interest received um, will be if we're investing in certain securities to receive incomes. So that would also fall under operating activities. So we'll stick with B, dividends paid. Question 48. Gino Corp's inventory has been bought for $8 million by ACA Incorporated and is predicted to be sold for $18 million. Both firms report under IFRS, and the net realizable value of the inventory is assumed to be $9 million. On the balance sheet of ACA Incorporated, inventories should most likely be shown at. Uh, so the key here is we're reporting under IFRS. Um, under IFRS, we uh, these standards do not want us to be overstating what our inventory is worth. And so we're going to be choosing the lower amount of what we bought our inventory for. So we bought for $8 million, um, and then looking at the net realizable value, which is $9 million. So we're going to be using the lower number of either of these. Um, so $8 million is less than $9 million, and we can see that's one of our answers here is A. So we will go with A, $8 million. Question 49. The following financial information is available at the end of the year for Terexa Incorporated. So it looks like we've got some different types of stock here and uh, shares authorized and shares outstanding and some other features. Let's read the question first before we dig into all this. Um, so we've got additional information, retained earnings at the start of the year equals $10 million. reported income for the year equals $2 million. Terexa's diluted EPS is closest to, we've got three numbers here as our answer. So let's pull in our um, diluted EPS formula and then we'll kind of triage that with um, our, the features of, and the information that we'll need from this table. So we're gonna have diluted EPS equals net income. Um, pretty quick there, we're just gonna take that two million this retained earnings number of 10 million is going to be um, relevant for this question, so we can ignore that. Uh, we're going to add back after tax interest on convertible debt. Um, so, looking at these stocks here, we've got two series of pre preferred stocks. Um, series A is non convertible with a dividend of $3 per share, and B is, is convertible um, with a dividend of $5.50 per share. So this is receiving a dividend, not a coupon payment. Um, they're both getting paid dividends, so the we're not going to have to account for any act after tax interest since it's a dividend payment, not a coupon payment. Um, but noted that each share is convertible into three common shares. Um, so this will be very important since we're looking at diluted EPS since convertible um, stock does uh, will dilute us so we'll need to account for that so then lastly from the net income or from the numerator portion we're going to subtract out the preferred dividends um, so we're going to be subtracting out three dollars per share times twenty thousand here which is sixty thousand on these convertible shares we won't have to subtract this out because we're assuming under diluted dps we're assuming that convertible shares are converted so since it'll be converted to equity, we'll no longer be paying out this um, preferred dividend to shareholders, so we don't need to account for that. Um, 
So from here, we'll take the weighted average number of shares outstanding, um, which is going to be this 500,000 as our starting point. And then to get the final number, really, we would need to take into account any share buybacks or additional shares issued, um, which there's no information on that here. So this number is just going to be 500,000 for us. And then we will add the additional shares that would have been issued at conversion. Um, so we come back to this convertible uh, preferred stock here. So each share can be uh, converted into three common shares. So we've got 50,000 shares and they can all go to three. So that's going to be 150,000 for that number. And, um, you know, just, just kind of conceptually, we can see how this does dilute the earnings per share. If these shares are converted, this number down here gets bigger, which is going to make that EPS number smaller. So let shareholders have um, less of a claim on the earnings of the company, which is why this is important to understand. Um, so from here, we'll just pull in all those numbers and walk through the math. So we've got our $2 million net income, and we subtract out just the 60000 in uh, preferred dividends from preferred stock A. And then we're going to divide that by our 500000 weighted average number of shares, um, plus the one fifty that we would have added if we convert or when we convert. Um, and then that gives us about 1.9 million over uh, 650,000, um, 2.9846. Uh, so that rounds to answer B. Question 50. Simon Belfast, an equity analyst, is analyzing two market leaders, Suncorp and Moon Incorporated, in the automotive industry. So we've got the two companies here and some uh, balance sheet information, it looks like. So using the data given in the table, Suncorp's cash ratio is closest to. So we're only going to be looking at Suncorp for this question. We can just ignore all the Moon, Corp, Moon Incorporated information. Um, so cash ratio, that's going to be our cash plus any cash equivalents um, over current liabilities. So we've got our cash here for Suncorp is going to be that 250000 Marketable securities will fall under uh, cash equivalents. This is probably just something like treasury bonds or something very liquid that's cash-like. Um, inventory won't be included. PPE will not be included either. And then it looks like that's the end of our assets. So on the liabilities portion, uh, sorry, so our cash plus equivalents is just going to be those two numbers there the 250 plus 380 and then current liabilities um, will be short-term liabilities of 300,000 long-term liabilities will not be included in that and then we've got common equity um, so we'll just have the 250 plus 380 over 300 and I've got that here so we'll pull that in and we can see that gets us to 2.1 answer a